This is the Fireside Chat, episode number four. I'm your host, Nick Papa, and joining me today is recently retired Lieutenant Tim Klett from FDNY's 88 Engine. Today, we're going to discuss engine company size up, estimating the stretch, line placement, and all things fire attack. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hey, Nick. How are you? How you been? I'm doing well, thanks, and glad to have you on here today. Yeah, well, finally got it in. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's begin with a quick rundown of your fire service background so the listeners can understand a little bit where you came from and the environment in which you worked in. Um, well, I started actually with Nick's dad years and years ago, a place called Newington, Connecticut. Um, I was part of their original cadet program in 1978. Uh, and I did just two and a half years with the cadets. And then I became a, a full firefighter in the, the town of Newington, which was the uh, largest all volunteer department in the state at the time. Uh, from there, I went to the city of New Britain uh, in 1987, and I worked there for about three and a half years as a paid fireman in the city of New Britain. And in 1990, I went to uh, New York City. Uh, I got assigned to Engine 47 on uh, in um, uh, Lower Harlem, and then uh, transferred up to 69 Engine in Central Harlem, uh, and got promoted in 2002, and ended up in 88 Engine. And I did uh, 19 years as lieutenant in 88, and uh, retired just after on just under 31 years with New York City. Excellent. <clears throat> so this conversation is going to be great because I think you have, with your experience, you have the ability to, to <clears throat> really go beyond the, the city tactics because you, you have the experience in the tenements of the Bronx and Harlem, but also, you know, coming up, you dealt with some of the more New England style of, of multiple dwellings, you know, the three deckers and you know, six family walk-ups that, that we have in our city. And then also, dealing with the, the suburban environment with private dwellings and single family homes as the rest of the, the country calls them. Uh, so th this conversation, I really want it to, to go beyond uh, cities and towns because the vast majority of the fire service is engine company driven. That's the one piece of apparatus that every single fire department has. And for many fire departments, it's just two firefighters on that hand line. So I wanna keep things as, as universal as we can so that we were, were reaching the most amount of the American Fire Service and have them walk away with some things that they can take away and apply to their next fire ground. You know, so, you know Nick, the one, the one thing I do wanna add, just so, so good, what people understand is like, there is a huge misconception about uh, the FDNY and, and, and um, the number of guys on a hand line. And I tell guys this all the time. We absolutely stretch hose with eight guys. There's no question about it. We put as many guys as we need to stretch that line, but we still push it in with two. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is that they think we're pushing a hand line in with 10 guys and we're just, we're not doing it. We train to push a hand line in with two guys, two firefighters and an officer. And that's our nozzle team. And that's what we push a hand line in. So when people tell me that, you know, like, listen, we don't have the staffing. You, I, I get it. You don't have the staffing to stretch, but if you can get the line into a position, two firefighters should be able to push that line in. Absolutely. And you also have experience as well with uh, your local volunteer department in Montgomery, New York, correct? Yes, I was a volunteer in uh, Montgomery for probably close to 18, 19 years, maybe even 20, I don't even know how long. Uh, so, I ended up being a lieutenant there for a while. Uh, it, was a, it was a good place. We did our fires up there. Uh, it was all right, you know. Absolutely. And better yet, you got to do it with your two boys who are yeah, now I did. Yep. And, congr and congratulations to your youngest for getting appointed to the Baltimore City Fire Department and joining his older brother as well. In the Baltimore City Fire Department. Yeah. And I had the pleasure of working with both of them and, uh, you know, in the volunteers in Montgomery and actually alongside my younger son, like I said, yeah, I just got hired in Baltimore, but he actually, uh, he made a rescue a, a year ago, July. I mean, a, a real good grab in a place that was off to the races and, uh, you know, he found the guy and got the guy out. The guy, unfortunately, the guy passed away. But, uh, you know, we always say you, you gave him the chance he needed. You know, it was up to him after we got him out of the place. And uh, so, yeah, it was fun. Absolutely. All right. So let's dive right in. So let's start out with uh, when the, the alarm of fire comes in, the, the bell hits for a working fire. So once you're responding to that fire, what were some of your in-cab routines when you were responding? Well, I, I think you got to clarify a couple of things is like there's a big difference between responding to a place that you know is on fire that you're responding to a working fire as opposed to you know getting a telephone alarm or getting a, a you know call 
that's saying they're reporting a fire and you don't know what it is. You know, your mindset's a little bit different. You know, you know what I mean? So if I'm, if I'm getting a ticket to the firehouse and they're reporting a fire on the fifth floor, you know, you know, a lot of things are the same, but a lot of things are different because, you know, those original decisions, if I'm going to a work and fire, they're already made, you know, the position of the line, you know, how big the line is, uh, the route it takes to get to the fire, those decisions have already all been made. So that kind of erases that from my plate if, I, if I'm going to a, a working fire. Um, if I'm going to a reported fire and I'm going to be the first new company there, you know, there's a myriad of things I'm thinking. I'm trying to visualize the block. And this, this doesn't really change whether I was in the volunteers or working in the South Bronx. You know, uh, when we were going to a uh, report of a fire up in Montgomery, I try to get a, you know, visualize the block, what type of homes were there, um, and, and try to narrow down the address, uh, and then trying to get more information about where the fire was, the location of the fire. In New York, you know, we get a report of fire on the fifth floor. So I, I would try to visualize that that building had a well, if I knew that building well, that they had a well hole that we could use for the stretch. Um, so there was a lot of things that's going through your head on the way in there. Um, the assignments, all that stuff's taken care of ahead of time on the paid side. On the volunteer side, assignments, they can be doled out when you get there based on the situation. But in a, on the paid side, you know, I don't have to worry about telling you, you're doing this, you're doing this, and you're doing this, because that's already been taken care of at the roll call at the start of the tour. You know, um, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, how we're getting there, the rate. And, you know, when you studied for lieutenant in New York, it was sir. That was what you could talk to the chauffeur about speed information and, and, and radio and information is kind of an open-ended category so you know we would have conversations if I knew where the hydrant was if I knew where my water source was you know and I usually I, you know my good chauffeurs I wouldn't get involved but uh, some other chauffeurs I would tell them this you know this is where I want you this is the hydrant we're taking you know I, I need you to clear the front of the building for the truck as opposed to a one-story ranch where I'm, I could care less about the front of the building for the truck that's an engine fire you know so there's a myriad of things going through your head uh, responding. Uh, the, the biggest thing for me is, you know, for anybody riding that front seat, and whether they're going to a, a reported fire or they're going to a fire that's already been declared a working fire, um, try to visualize the building, you know, try to get that layout. I always say that what makes a firefighter a great firefighter is understanding layouts. If he can look at a building and break that down from the outside or get, you know, you know, you go to high ranch, high ranches, you know, you go to one of them, you go to a thousand, they're all the same. So that's what I mean about understanding layouts. You know, the route you would take once you're in the smoke. You know, if you know the layout, that route is pretty much planned for you before you even get there. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. So when I have these drills with with my firefighters, and we and I try and do it at every chance we get. You know, the EMS uh, runs are the the, be the best time to do this. Is you're getting a chance to walk through somebody's house in a sterile environment. And, and same thing with a lot of these these three deckers and the, the six families that that I run into, the layouts are very standardized. And it, even if they're a little atypical, usually you can use the building features to kind of pick apart and find those little little differences and nuances that they may have. And but that's that's key though. And I use the the, the phrase you know creating that mental blueprint in your mind. So when my nozzle firefighter is waiting at the tailboard. You know, I always tell them, try and envision what it's going to look like inside and then how you're going to get to the fire. That's so that way you kind of have that that destination in mind when you cross that threshold. Well, and also what it does is it, it frees your mind up for other things. You know, it's that muscle memory activity that we talk about. You know, the, the things that you normally do with fire, if you do them all the time, they just happen. You don't even have to think about them happening. And so if, if you understand layouts, if you pull up to a, you know, a typical New Britain three-decker or one of the three-story bricks, which tend to mirror an old law tenement for us in New York, you know, if you know that, my mind is free to, to worry about, okay, you know, what's the stairway look like now? Um, you know, I've got parked cars or I've got snow or I've got something that's going to impede my travel from the back step to the front door. So, you know, if you understand these things ahead of time and you get that out of the way, it frees your mind up for, for other stuff that needs to happen that you need to do also. Uh, Tim, were there, uh, there any other ways that you instilled this information in, into your guys other than just showing it to them on runs? Was there any that, any other tools that you utilized in order to uh, to provide that information for your firefighters? Well, we would we would stretch, you know, at vacant buildings. Uh, we would go through the stretch. We'd actually flow some water, but it became it's it, you know if you're in a busier place, it's very hard uh, without going out of service to actually you know do do that hands on and 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 stretch 
you know, inevitably you get a run and you're leaving holes in the street and you got to come back and get it. And, you know, anything worth any money's gone. So, uh, uh, it, so, you know, we did a lot in the firehouse. We used to do, the, we do well. All I, what I did was um, I would use the ice rescue device we had. Basically, it's a two and a half inch cap with a Schrader valve on it. And you can fill holes with air. And instead of filling line with water, once we stretched it into an occupied building, if we did say a rope stretch or a uh, well hose stretch, I, you know, you'd like to charge the hose to show them, you know, how it reacts when it's in a hanging position. And it worked very well with that. Uh, ice rescue device. You could fill it with air and it would kink like a regular kink coming over the windowsill. So I would do that and I would show them, you know, it's it's easy to say, you know, that's a kinking point, but then you charge a line with air and it kinks there and, and they it, instead of visualizing, they're actually seeing it, you know. So we did a lot of that. Uh, doing going up well holes. We did a lot of the rope stretch because that was our bread and butter sometimes. Um, and uh, for me, you know, I, I shouldn't have to train on, on our ordinary stretches. You know, I have a first floor fire and a two and a half story frame down the block from the firehouse. I shouldn't have to, you know, if they do that wrong, I'm not, I'm not doing my job. But if the chief tells me, listen, I need a line to the top floor and you can't use the stairs. You know, that's something we don't do all the time. And, and that's the thing I train on. That's the thing that we're not going to do all the time. That's a little bit more challenging. You know, the standpipes, we, we drill a lot on the standpipes because to me, I, I always believed it was the it was the hardest evolution an engine would do because so much had to go right. You know, going from a pre-connect to a standpipe, it kind of runs the gamut of engines because, you know, pre-connect, very little can go wrong. It's already connected. You got to, you know, you got to pull one valve and you get water, you know, where the standpipe, we've got to supply the system. We got to bring all our gear there. We've got to hook it up. We've got to hook it to the system. We've got to find a place to, to flake it out. You know, so, so many things need to go right in that evolution. And those are the things that I really would key in on during my drills, the stuff that we don't do that often, but could really pose an issue to us if they went wrong. Absolutely. So let's say we're, we're, we're coming into the block and we know we've got a, a working fire. Uh, take me through your, your process of, of how you start sizing up the building and formulating your, your plan of attack. Well, so again, there's that, that gray area. I mean, if I'm first due, you know, like I, I um, years ago when I was in, in Harlem, an old timer told me that, you know, he never looks at the front of the buildings. He always looks the first, the first peak he takes is up over the rooftops. And, and I can tell you that on a number of occasions, um, I have given a, a working fire signal at 1075. Um, and everybody asked me, what did you see? What did you see? And I said, well, I could see it coming over the roof. So, you know, whenever I turn into a block and, and I have it, it's lined with buildings, I always kind of look up above the, even if it's private homes, I try to get up above the tree line because if I have a fire in the rear of an occupancy, I might not see it if I'm looking straight down the block. So, you know, the first thing I do, I'll check up over the rooftops. And, and if I, if I have a good column, if I, if I see smoke, then I'll, then I'll um, try to determine what I have based on a smoke. So this one morning, um, we turned the block and I had a pretty thin column of smoke and I had embers blowing up in it. I had a real good fire, but very indicative of a fire in the shaft that the fire has gotten out into the shaft and probably impinging on multiple floors within that building. And, and that was a simple look above the rooftops that gave me that information. Um, once I know I have a fire, I've got to, I've got to find a place where I can get water, especially if I'm in a hydrated area, you know, we won't even get into you know, setting up a, uh, a water delivery system with tanks and drafting and stuff. I mean, you can spend the whole day on that. But if I'm in a hydrant area, you know, based on the building, you know, I'm going to decide my location of what hydrant I want my guy to take. Normally, what we'll do, we'll stop in the front of the building. You know, we'll jump off that rig. Uh, they'll grab the lines and the rig will drive away to the, to the closest hydrant. That clears the front of the building for the, um, the uh, truck. Um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, the, the stretch and, you know, basically I never, I've never yelled out five links, six links. Um, the only time I've done that, if it was an extraordinary long stretch where I would take control of that. And I would say, listen, 10 links, minimum of 10 links for this fire. Now, if we were two over, we were two over, but it beats being one under, Do you, you know what I mean? So, um, Unless it's an extraordinary long stretch in a bigger building, not, not, I normally let the guys in the back step take care of that. Um, and, and, then I, and if I get in that building and we have a well hole or no well hole, you know, I'll let them know that also. 
you know, based on the location of the fire within a bigger building. If the fire is on the third floor, it makes no sense to go up the well because you're only going up two flights. But the fire is on the fifth or sixth floor and you're going up four and five flights, the well hole becomes a quick, effective way to, to get that line uh, in position to operate. Absolutely. So with the, uh, to get a complete look at a building, uh, when you're doing your, your, your check of the rear to get that full 360 degree view, if you can, uh, what are some of the things that you're specifically looking for, especially when it comes to, you know, locating where the seat of the fire is and where your point of best point of access is going to be? Well, you know, to be honest with you, you know, as the first arriving officer, I'm, I'm probably not going to do that 360. You know, um, even if even if I can, even if it's a standalone to an F story frame, F story flat top, you know, I, I'm probably not going to do that. I can, as an engine officer, I can really get a lot of information. And if it's a standalone, they said oh, it's it's a quick shot to the backyard. If I get three sides of a building and get a view over the rooftops, I can pretty much. The only thing I can't really see in the rear is is occupants. You know, what I mean, that's the only thing I'm I'm not going to be able to determine. Uh, by not making that trip to the rear. As the engine officer, now the, the chief's going to want to get that information. He's going to want to know what's going on in the back. But for me, my decisions can be made. I, I've already got the depth of the building, right? I, I can see, and even if there's a setback, one of the either the either the you know the two or the four side or whatever you guys B and D side, you know, I should see that elongation of the rear of the building, the step down and and a setback. So um, the depth of the building I can get with three sides. The height of the building I can get from the front. So, you know, I, I'm really not looking for that. If I did go, I would be looking for alternate means of access and egress. And again, like I'm not, I don't care whether, I don't care about, you know, I know from the front if I have a first floor, second floor fire. I just, I'm not sure if I have a basement fire yet. That's the only thing I, that I can't rule out from the exterior. It's very hard to do that. You know, I have to get in or have someone physically check that cellar to see if it's down there. But if the fire's in the first, second, third, fourth, I can tell that from the exterior, you, you know? So I don't need to go to the rear and report that I had fire in the second floor. I, I already know that, you know? So, and, and for us, most um, primary means of access to a building is gonna be the front door. You know, in some places, uh, the side doors become the primary means of access and egress. But in those places, if, if you know your buildings, you're going to that. And again, I can get it from the front of the building. So, uh, you know, for me, go to rear as that first new officer. I'm probably not going to do it unless unless it's an oddball place that I can't get the information that I need to, to do what I need to do with that hose line to get it in the position to operate. Then I might take a quick check at rear. Excellent. So the next point is, is you touched on it a little bit already with, you know, saying that you, more times than not, you, the, the front is going to be the, the, the primary means of access. Where, so where are you determining where your, your drop point's going to be? As far as what? I mean, dropping your folds? Yes. Yeah, dropping your folds and then where we're, where we're char charging the line. Well, based on where the fire is and what, fire, what the fire has possession of. You know, so if, if I have, a, if I have a, a wood frame house and I have a good body of fire on the first floor, my drop point is going to become the front porch or the front door or whatever point we're using to get in and out building. You know, because, you know, there's a real gray area about taking an uncharged line into a house. You know, we do it at the tenements, but we don't consider the entire building the fire area. You know, just the, the apartment that's on fire. So we stretch to the door of the apartment. And in a private home though, I think that you, you really risk um, getting yourself in trouble by, you know, even if it's a second floor fire by stretching in dry, getting halfway up to the second floor and then charging it there. I, I don't think it's a good practice. So, you know, for me, I'm calling for water at the front door. Even if it's a second floor fire in the rear, I'm calling for water. The time it's gonna save me to get that 12 feet to the top of the stairs isn't enough to risk getting to the second floor without water and then having um, the first floor light off because there was an area of fire that we didn't see. So, you know, normally I consider a private home the entire fire, the entire home, the fire area, and I'm charging my line and flaking it out at that point of entry. You know, I'm glad you. I mean, I can I can quote fires where the nozzle man is stretched in dry, and uh, unfortunately, we've had a line of duty. Um, you know, two of them stick out in particular. We, you know, we won't talk about them, but you know, there's two that stick out in particular when they took they took a dry line in, and and it, you know, it ended up biting me. 
you know, and for the amount of time it saves you. And, and you know, the, the question I always get about it is manpower. Well, we don't have the manpower. You know, we're talking really, if the, if the stairway is right inside the front door, we're talking 15 feet of hose. That's what we're talking now. You know, so let's let's put things in perspective here. You know, if you're willing to roll, the dot, roll, roll that dice for 15 feet of hose, knock yourself out. And this is the st- kind of step I was looking for, because this is the, the real conversation that needs to be had. And, you know, breaking it down to you know, talking about that legitimately 15 feet of real estate that we're, we're, we're splitting hairs over. And then uh, I'm, I'm really glad you, you touched on, because that was going to be my next question, is what about the second floor fire? Is the, the stairs up for grabs? And you, you went exactly where I wanted this to go. And that you also have to take into mind, too, is that the environment that you're trying to, to manage that hose in. So instead of being out on that, at that front door, at the stoop or in the front lawn, having that space to be able to properly flow check that line, man it, you know, manage the kinks and get that line ready, uh, ready to be in service versus trying to do that on the stairway with, you know, things off to the races above. You know, we could split hairs with any elevation or, or de-elevation. I mean, like, even a cellar fire, it'd be so much easier for me to flake out to the top of the stairs, a dry line, you know, in the opposite direction of travel down the stairs and, and make my move, but it just isn't safe. And, you know, even if I can see, if it, even if it's going to be a 30 second run to the stairs and flake it out, it just isn't worth, you know, rolling that dice. I'm going to take the little extra time, get it set up, have water in case, in case something happens, in case the fire wants to show itself. And, and then I can, I can deal with that. Um, so, you know, there is a real, real gray area though, when you get to a, you know, like a two and a half story frame and you have an attic fire. Now there's a, there's a, there's a big question there. And again, you know, I'm not that guy that's going to say that, you know, there's always and nevers and this and that you should do. But if you're going to stretch dry to the second floor for, you know, for, you know, all purposes would be a third floor fire, an attic in a two and a half story frame. You know, I'm not totally opposed to that, but I'd be totally opposed to that without a check of the first floor first to make sure that that isn't a fire that started on the first floor that got into, a, uh, you know, a, a stud bay and now is showing itself on in the attic. If you're sure it's an attic fire, you know, I'm not totally opposed to that at all. Just remember that, you know, good attic fires do from time to time tend to blow down the the sheetrock. So, you know, again, the real estate we're saving and and the risk we're taking, that risk benefit there, um, is it worth it? And that's going to be, you know, guys, personal decisions. I know how I would operate, uh, you know, simply because I've seen some things happen. and, And thank God there was a second line there in time. Yeah, and I think that also that clear distinction between the, the single family versus multi, uh, multi-family dwelling environment is is very different because, as you perfectly put it, the the multiple dwellings are are almost treated as separate they're as separate occupancies within one building. Well, so the big, you know, that's a big thing for that first officer. You pull up here, that first engine. It's your job to determine the fire area. The chief isn't going to run up and do that for you. You've got to determine the, and the boundaries of that. You know, so when I go to a, a private home, like I said, the boundaries of the pro- entire house, two story, you know, whatever that's. So once I do that, you know, that's what really dictates where I charge my line. Once I've decided the boundaries of, of what I consider the fire area. So if, if I go to a, a 20 story building and the fire's on the 18th floor and it's a stretch, I'm not going to stretch to charge to the 18th floor. You know, we can, we consider the door to the fire apartment almost the same as the door to a private house, right? And we'll stretch dry to that door, flake out and in charge. You know, so, you know, that first officer really needs to determine, you know, to the best of his ability, what he considers the fire area. And then that dictates where you stretch that nozzle to and where you charge that line. But without that determination, you know, you're going to be stretching places that, that you really don't know where you're going. You've got to determine that. that that's going to be your decision as that officer, where that line goes and how it gets there. That's a big decision. So speaking on that, would you recon ahead of your your crew while they were stretching or would you oversee the stretch itself? Well, so we can circle back a little bit. If if I've taken my guys out, which I did and drilled with them, if I still have to watch them conduct a stretch, I'm just not drilling enough. Do you know what I mean? I, I will no, I I I don't watch them. They're very capable and and you know, if it's a private house. You know, I have other things to do. I may recon the building. I may be in the building before the line is there trying to find out where the fire is, you know, searching around and then come back out and meet them. And, you know, there's a gray area uh, 
not really for me, but in, in places that don't have a dedicated truck. You know, you get in there and start searching them for the fire and you find a, a, an unconscious victim. You know, remember, you still are that engine officer, you know, and it's your job to call for water. So if you get involved in a rescue, you, just, you know, that, that, that first shot in, you got to remember that it's going to be your job to get that line in place. So, you know, there was a lot of times I got to a fire before the truck did. And I got in a little bit uh, to find out where the fire was, but I never lost sight of the fact that, listen, my job is to make sure that line gets flaked out, charged and pushed into that apartment or private home. And it was very hard to get, you know, you, you had to remove yourself sometimes from that stuff because, because the importance of getting that line in and, and that line having supervision. Absolutely. What would your recommendations be for, uh, for a lot of the, the short staffed American fire service where, you know, even if you are the officer, you may be one of the members stretching the line. So in that case where let's just say it's the officer, one backstep firefighter and a driver, you know, the typical three firefighter crew, uh, what would your, your recommendations be for, for that officer to tr wear it, trying to wear both hats at the same time? You know, I, I get that question a lot um, when I'm out doing stuff. And, you know, what, what position, excuse me, what position I would take? Um, we, let's, let's go back to the stretch and then we'll get to the actual, um, you know, what I would tell a, a, um, a place that has mi minimal staffing, an officer and one guy stretching, um, by the numbers. That's what I would tell you. If you do it by the numbers, it, it's going to take it. There's no way you're going to stretch a line like eight guys would with two. You're just not. So you, you have to be more proficient about it. You may have to work a little harder. You may have to carry more holes with you, you know, to the drop point, you know, and that officer. So, but the officer, he can never lose sight of the fact that he's an officer. So he's got to be able to, to um, occasionally deviate from, from being that fireman stretching. And not, I'm not saying dropping the line, but stopping and reevaluating what's going on with the fire boat itself. Has the conditions changed since I ran to the to the back step and grabbed that up the second length of hose, you know, and started stretching with this guy, you know? So you've got to continually reevaluate, and you know you're just going to have to take your time. Do it by the numbers. Do it the way you train, you know. Uh, if the nozzle one takes the nozzle and runs, you got to tell him slow down. Let me get it, let me get my links and we'll walk together. If that's the way you pack your hose, you know, we're not even going to get into you know different type of hose packs and you know whether I think they're good or not or whatever, but just do it by the numbers and take your time. It's, it's just, you know, it's as simple as that. And, and if the chauffeur or the, the guy driving has to help you uh, within reason, because, you know, he should really stay within 20 to 30 feet of that apparatus. But he, there's a lot he can do in that distance. And I, and I would train that way. Like, you know, and I wouldn't let him know. But during my drills, I would just yell to him, stop that and help me and see how he operates. See what he does. when he, Does he lose it? Does he say, I've got to do this? Because that doesn't matter if this doesn't get where it needs to be, you know. So one thing builds off. As far as once that line is there and flaked out, you know, a guy asked me, you know, would you take the nozzle? And and it's a it's a good question. And and my answer personally is I never would. If I was the officer, I you know, and, and as good as I think I am, the minute you get that nozzle in your house in your hand, um, it would be very hard to keep your perspective of the problem is why is it needs to be as an officer. You know, it, you start working that nozzle, your perspective narrows down to what that nozzle is coveraging. And, you know, as an officer, you know, I've got to worry about everything else. I, I'm looking around, you know, you know, so unless you're real, real good, I, I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if I would take the nozzle. I would definitely back them up. I, you know, I would, I would slow him down. I would speed him up. I would tell him stay here while I get more hose. You know, that specific duty of operating the nozzle, I think it's very hard to do that and still do what you need to do as a company level officer, you know, to maintain everything and then give you reports. You know, hey, chief, what's going on in here? I can't talk to you if I got the nozzle right now. You know, he, he, the chief don't want to hear that. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's how I would handle that, you know, um, that smaller number of guys, you know, one nozzle man and an officer, I'd probably back them up. Absolutely. So talking about the, the actual stretch, just in terms of, of estimation, though, because we touched up about how the pre-connects are at one end of the spectrum, but then we go all the way into the, the static ho the hose loads. And mm. even with pre-connects, you still have to do yes. some sort of estimation. 
because so the only uh, difference between a static stretch and a pre-connected stretch is I need to estimate the distance from the rig to the front door. It's the only difference. Right? Even with a pre-connected bed, you've got to estimate how much hose you're going to need in the fire area from the front door in. Right? That's you have to estimate that stretch. Because if it isn't in place at, at your point of entry, whether it's an apartment door, a side door, a front door, a back door, it doesn't matter. You still have that, you need that available hose positioned and staged at that entry point. If you don't bring up the needed hose, you're going to come up short. So the misconception is of pre-connect is no estimation, which is not true. You know, the only difference is on a static stretch, I estimate how long, how many links of hose it takes me to get from the bumper to the point where I'm getting in that building. After that, the estimates are the same. You know, so, you know, if you're estimating once you're in the building, if, it, if it's a private home, if it's a one-story private home, 50 feet's going to get you in. You want a coupling nozzle side by side at the front door. I mean, that's, you know, we build everything off of couplings. And, and here's the thing is, when we talk about hose and people, I don't know what's happened in the fire service, but I need 75 feet of hose. And I'm, I laugh at them, I go, 75 feet of hose? You mean you need two links? We talk about hose in lengths, not feet, right? When we're estimating our stretch, I need a length of hose in the house. And if I need 57 feet of hose in the house, you know what I need? Two links. It's as simple as that. We Stop playing the game of, of trying to estimate it down to the, okay, it's 62 and a half feet. It's ridiculous. Anything over 50 feet, guess what? Two links. It's as simple as that. And I don't know where we go on and start, you know, the stretch is 57 and a half feet. So we need, as, as engine guys, we need to remember that, you know, it's important that we, when we talk about hose, if you're using 50 foot sections, you know, there are 100 foot sections out there um, that we talk about links. You know, how many links is my hose bed? Now I know I have, you know, oh, it's a 300 foot pre-connect. So how many links is that? Ask somebody, that's 300 feet. They don't know, it's, it's six links. You know, but it's important remember because the guy pumping's got to understand links. He pumps for links, not for feet, right? You know, we use friction loss per length, not per feet. So it's important to understand that. So I would, when I'm estimating from the front door in, you know, most houses 50 feet's going to get you anywhere because that's your start point. But if you're stretching to a third or fourth floor of a building, um, you've got to estimate the distance from the front door to where you're going to operate. So, you know, we basically use one length per floor. And the problem people do, if, if they, the fire's on, say, the fourth floor, they think they need four links, but you're only going up three levels, right? So, but if you go four, then four is the is the 50 for the fire department itself. So, but, but most guys don't estimate it that way. They think four stories and four links, and then they add another length for the fire department. Absolutely. But that's that second estimate. So the first one's from the rig to the front door. The second one is from the front door to wherever the point of operation is if we're going to stretch dry. And then the third estimate is how much holes do I need in the fire area? Right? And that's the big one. That's the big one. Because, you know, I don't know if anybody, I came up five feet short one time, you know, full length, really. And uh, I tried to find another length and I had to watch a second engine stretch right by me and put my fire out. You know, and it was pretty embarrassing. So the big one is once you're in that fire apartment, you make sure you have enough hose staged at that entry point, coupling nozzle, you know, two couplings, that whatever it's going to be, you know, staged at that point to make it to the farthest point within that and that in that uh, apartment. And that's where layouts come into play. You know, understanding that, you know, if you're in a, in a building in, say, on uh, Myrtle Street, you know, or even even Upper Beaver Street or Farmington Avenue when you're Britain there. And you got one of those four stories, you know, um, and say the B line of apartments, they're the big one. You know, you have, you know, the one side are smaller and the one side are bigger. So so one, one apartment may need a, uh, two links in it and the other one might need three in it because it's a bigger apartment. Understand that ahead of time will allow you to make that estimate. Absolutely. And I think just the, the common thread here is just going back to it's knowing your building stock. And that's, it's getting out in your neighborhoods, knowing what you're dealing with. And it's doing that, that, that front end work to make sure that you're ready for when the bell hits to, to actually do your job. So that that's, that's really key. And I, I'm glad that we keep circling back to this whole knowledge of building construction and knowing your area and 
and training because that's what the heart of all of this is. It's there's no it's no secret. It's 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 really just it's the the basics well, and applying it within your your area. You know, I used to have guys, you know, Mike and Barrow, where you come in, you know, me, come on, engine work, Timmy, how hard is it? It's on off, it's on off. And, you know, it, in reality, he's right. You know, it that aspect of it isn't hard, but I don't think, I, I never grade a, an engine company on how they put water on the fire. I don't. You know, like I always say that the, the mark of a good engine is how they stretch hose. I mean, that's like signing your name to a check, you know. 88 engine has signed their name to Belmont Avenue because we know how to stretch hose. And you know, if 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 it's a six-story building and we stretch 30 links of hose and you know 29 links are in the street and one is in the building, you know, every other company sees that. You know, they don't they don't see, you know, the fire always goes out. You know that, right? I mean, I've never not seen one go out, but that that stretch is there for the world to see. And that's the mark of a good engine company. Your stretch, the way you set up for the fight. The fight, that's easy. I can talk a two-year-old through a fire, right? The stretch is the key. That's, you want to be a good engine, stretch, 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 and stretch. And know how to do it. Know how to do it second. Know how to do it with two guys. Know how to do it with three guys. Know how to do it with one guy. But the mark of a good engine is stretch nose. Just like the mark of a good ladder company is how they overhaul a room in my book. Uh, if I walk into a room and this you know, there's plaster hanging and there's laugh hanging. I mean, to me, it was a shit cut truck company. You know, you go through them, it's totally cleaned out. All the plaster, all the laugh is down. Anything burned is out the window. That's the mark of a good truck. You know, that's their signature. In the engine, it's how we stretch hose. It's, fires all go out. They all go out. So, t Tim, arguably, arguably the, the most hose you ever stretched when you've first got to 69 engine when you guys were burning multiple times a, sh a shift in some of these these vacant tenements what was the the culture at 69 engine you know how did you get other than just the volume of fire that you were doing what made 69 engine the engine company that it was and what were some of the lessons that you carried from 69 into 88 once you became a boss so I think we made that place exceptional. Well, one was the work because, you know, when the year, we were the king of the mountain when I was up there. It was, you know, it was just one of those times in that area that, you know, and other areas started to get slow. But, you know, one, you know, as many times as we were stretching a tour uh, at fires, but, you know, we were busy, but we still drilled every day. And I think that was the attitude. And the other thing was, is, and, and I tell officers this, you want, you, when I do my officers class, I say, you want to know when you know you've made it as an officer in a company that you've established yourself is when the guys come up to your office and they say, hey, Lou, we're having a drill downstairs if you want to come down and drill with us. If I want to drill with them. And that's how 69 was. We were drilling all the time and we didn't need the officers to drill. You know, we knew that we, we had stuff. We would look at buildings. We, I had great officers. I mean, the, the officers were Second to none. I mean, Patty Brown, Bob Morris, you know, John Newell, they, they were exceptional. But, uh, you know, I think the fact that we just didn't go to fires and, and come back to the firehouse and go to our Xbox it didn't exist. Then. You know, we would talk about the fire and then we would drill on the fire and then we would drill. You know, we were one of the first guys to have a forced laundry door in the basement. You know, so we constantly drilled, constantly, even though we were real busy. We were still we were still drilling on stretching. I mean, I I had a boss that actually wanted to you know light fires for us to practice putting out in vacant buildings. You know, we we didn't do that, but you know we would stretch in vacant buildings. We throw water in vacant buildings. We cut roofs in vacant buildings. Uh, we drilled all, all the time, even though we were going to a lot of fires. We, you know, we didn't take it as we could always be better. You know, we could always do our job better. And and the other thing was is you were held accountable in that place. You know, if you if you didn't make your position or something went wrong with the stretch and, and they can trace it back to you, you were held accountable and you were called to task. You know, I, I went to a fire with, and it just, you know, it was a tougher fire. And it just took us a long time to, to put it out. You know, they had booby trapped the apartment a little bit. We couldn't we could see it. We just couldn't find out where it was. And it took a real long time to get it a lot longer than it should have. And when we got back to the firehouse, uh, the, the chief that was working, uh, Bernie Cassidy, wonderful, wonderful man, um, took us into the kitchen and kind of, he didn't really ream us out, but he let us know that, hey, you know, something went wrong. And you, you felt like you let your father down. 
you know, and that's, that was the mindset in that place. And, and when I left there, you know, one thing was a guy told me, don't expect other companies to operate the way you, we did in 69. And in some places I was covering, I learned the hard way that, you know, I expected things to happen that didn't happen. So I realized that, you know, I was playing in the realm of the weakest member of my team. That was the arena I was playing in when I first got promoted. You know, I couldn't expect them to operate in my arena. I, so I had a, so it was my job to bring them up to play in my arena, to play in the same level as I thought that, that they should be playing. In. And that's what I set out to do. I, you know, that training mindset, drilling, and, you know, taking care of the guys, making sure they had what they needed, making, you know, all that stuff matters when it comes to game day. So that's kind of the mindset I took out of it. So I want to keep uh, uh, going down that road because I think that's going to uh, really hit home with a lot of uh, a lot of people listening in is not every place is going to be the 69 engine. So how or 88. You... 80 engine was, 88 was top notch, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for those, th for those places that don't already have that established high performance uh, culture of accountability, how would you recommend that a company officer or even the backstep firefighter who's, who's trying to, you know, push that, uh, move that needle forward. How would you recommend that they go about doing that? What would be your, your words of wisdom? Cause you said you learned, you learned some of these lessons the hard way. And that to me, that is my, one of my biggest drivers behind everything that I do is to try and pass along the mistakes that I've made. So other people don't have to step on those same landmines. Um, you know, it's a topic that comes up a lot. Um, and some people you're not going to change. That's just the way it is. You're some people you're not going to change, but you know, I've had a couple guys that got on the job, and, um, that were really into it and they were getting beat down for it. And I'm like, listen, don't let them change you. You know, if you're driven now in 10 years, you should still be driven. And in 15 years, you should still be driven. You know, don't let them change who you are. Um, you know, as a young fireman coming in trying to change a company, you know, I don't know if you will, and I don't know if you can, um, but don't allow yourself to be changed. You know, you should know that rig. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was first got in the job in 47 engine, I was, you know, I knew that rig inside and out and still every, every tour I went over that rig and for two, three hours every night after dinner, I'd be out there going through that knot. And I didn't do it to make myself look good. I did it because I wanted to make sure that that rig was, you know, that I knew where everything was that, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, and the officer sees that you're, you're, you know, you're involved and, and tends to um, step up and um, want to get, wants to get involved in training. And I would ask the officer, I mean, listen, you mind if we do this? You know, if you don't ask, you know, the, the culture of fire services is, um, it, it's tough sometimes. When when you're young and aggressive, and especially if you go to a place that the guys have been there and they're established in their ways, um, it, it's very very hard to change it. Um, I think you got to be very delicate in how you do that, but just be who you are. I mean, I think that that's the biggest biggest takeaway from the whole thing. Just you know what? No one's going to get mad at you for looking at the rig. No one's going to get mad at you for practicing with the Halligan bar. No one's going to get mad at you for you know asking to go to a building and, and look at the layout or an EMS run taking an extra five minutes and walking around and trying to, to learn something. And I think that can be contagious, especially if some of the stuff you learn gets applied to a future run. Like, how'd you know that? Well, because I walked that building in the last EMS run. I had. So, you know, I th you think if you keep your head down and, and slowly but surely, I think other people will become involved, maybe not to the point you are, but at least you know, they're trying to head that way or, or they, they see the interest that you have. It's a tough, it's a tough thing. Yeah. And at that, the, uh, I heard it from Jim McCormick from, from FDTN, Lieutenant Indianapolis. Uh, but I think he, he said it in a really great way was, you know, learn to adjust your expectations, but never lower your standards. And I think that's in a nutshell, what exactly what you're just talking about. I had, I had, great guys so and you know expectations and standards you know to me I, there was a lot of non-negotiables i had some non-negotiables 
as an officer. And, you know, that was it. You know, we were going to drill. You know, I wasn't, you know, the meal was important, but it was, it, you know, we were going to drill. It was a non-negotiable. And that didn't mean we went out every night and, and took all the hose off the roof. We would, you know, we would put something on the TV and talk about a fire and they could still, but to me, that was a non-negotiable. And I had some guys that weren't into the fire service at all. They went home. They don't want to talk about the fire. They don't care less, but they were great firemen. So, you know, my expectations of them being where I am, like, if you're really into it, don't ever think that someone's going to be, get to that, that that's into it every day. That's got a bookshelf full of stuff behind. It's just not, but it doesn't mean they're not good at their job. And if you lose interest in that guy simply because he's not at the level you are as far as interest in the job, then that's a bad thing, you know? So that's that expectations and, and, and stuff like, and standards and stuff. I'm never going to lower my standards because I have non-negotiables. You know, I always, you know, when 88 showed up and, and the one thing when I was in 88, um, we had, the company had a great reputation, you know, and, you know, and I, I believe that I did, I hope I did too myself, but when we showed up, especially when I was working, we were getting put to work. And I would tell guys that we're going to go to work at this fire tonight, simply because they know that you guys are going to get it done. And more times than not, you know, Soka tells that story all the time. Um, how he had three engines ahead of me and he pulls me over and I told him, Hey, I got an engine ahead of me. He tells me, I don't care. You know, if you're ready to go to work and he, and they know you're trained, you're going to go to work. You're going to get the difficult task. And I, and I, you know, I embrace that. That's what I want. Yeah. You know, and I wanted, 80, I wanted 88 to be that way because, because 69 was that way. You know, when we showed up in 69 engine, you know, they, they knew you know, that we were going to get the job done. We were going to put that fire on. And 88 was that way too. You know, and I wanted to keep that mindset just because we, you know, wasn't as busy as, as 69 was. Doesn't mean, you know, like it only takes one fire to kill you. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that's, the, that's the pinnacle for any company is to be that, that go-to crew that when, when things, when the chips are down and you see the chief yep. looking around, he's looking for that, that company to get the job done. Yep. So be ready to go to work. You know, you know, I would always walk up you know, and, and it was something that John Newell taught me years ago. Like he always used to carry that rope with him. First, second, third, do he didn't carry, he carried it. So, you know, when I was showing up, I and I always made sure they saw it. You know, I had my game that I would play. You know, I'd walk up to the command post and I'd hold the like stretch and I'd hold the bottle up so they saw it. I wasn't saying just so they saw that I had that bottle and they saw that nobody else did and they needed another line. They knew I was ready to go to work. And the other thing that I put into my guys were that, you know. If we weren't first or third due, where the first two lines were already stretched and they're, you know, and our books are spelled out who gets those lines, after that, it's anybody's bet. So when we showed up after that, like on a second alarm or as an additional engine, I would tell them, my nozzle is new. Like, you're going to find me when you get off my fire truck. You go find a fire truck that's closer than ours that I can stretch a line off of if they need one. And I would walk and they would tell me about 42 engines. They're right around the corner if we need a line. And I would tell them. And I'd hold up the bottle. I'd say, I'd stretch them. Hey, 88's there. We're second on a second. If you need no line, I can get one off of 42. You know what they say? Yeah, start me a line to the explosion. All the time. All the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's having that game plan already in place. Being prepared. That's all. Just be prepared. It's not that hard to do. It just, it isn't. You know, if we're surprised, you know, we go to work and you're you go to a fire and you're surprised that the chief wants you to go do something, then shame on you. Go somewhere else. No, be a be a milk milk. You know, drive a good humor truck, but get off the fire truck. Amen to that. So we've talked about the the size up rolling up all the way through to the stretch. So let's uh, let's round this out with with actually moving in on the fire. So once once we've done uh, all that front end work, we've we've stretched, we've managed our line. You know, we've we've done our flow check and made sure that the line's in service. But once we Pop open that door. Take me through the uh, the, the the final uh, the final act here and the actual extinguishment effort. You know what was, how was your your me, you know your method of approach from so, once you crossed the threshold to actually putting the fire out. So so listen like you know like, you know I think that that your demeanor is is at that point everything leading up to that point your demeanor it doesn't really matter because you're almost. You're almost working removed from your company because I, like we said, I've trained my company. I'm not watching that stretch unless I'm helping, unless I'm, it's me and an officer, me and one fireman and I'm helping him. 
but if I have two, three guys, I'm, I'm not watching that stretch. I have other stuff to do. So, you know, that your demeanor with, with the men, with the firefighters, don't come into play until we reunite at the entrance to the fire area. And then your demeanor is a lot. And, and if you're nervous, if you, listen, who doesn't get excited at fires, right? But a true professional can control himself, right? You can't control yourself. You can't control the fire unless you can control yourself. So I would always take a deep breath and, and uh, I'd have a conversation with my announcement every time. Ask him if he's ready. You know, and I always told him, you're the one who calls for water. Not on the radio. I do. But when you're ready, you're going to ask me for water. That's, that was the thing we, that they knew ahead of time because I'm not stretching the hose, right? It's your job. Remember, as that firefighter, it's your job to stretch the hose and make sure there's enough at the entranceway. I'm not doing that, you know? So are you ready? And if they say, no, I want to get some more hose up here, fine, take your time, bro. I don't care, you know? So, and that was the demeanor. I had a couple of fires that stick out on, you know, uh, I had a real, 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 real good fire one night. And it was the fire that we saw coming over the rooftops. We had, you know, we had fire out about, between the two floors, out of six, seven windows. And um, we get in and I had a probie on the nozzle, probie backing them up and myself. We get in and we get in about five feet and it's exit stage right. They, they want out. They want out of the apartment. And so I'm trying to calm them down. And, I, I, and, and they were, they did a great job. You know, it was one of the, it was, a, I mean, the job of a lifetime, really. And so I, I kind of go up over the backup man and I put my hand on, on the nozzle man's back shoulder and I try to stop him and he just wants out so we end up backing out and I grab them and I'm, I'm still not mad I'm not yelling you know I'm, and that's the thing don't don't raise your voice you know and I just said to him I go listen either you're doing this or I am I mean where we have to put this fire up and he said that he thought he didn't have enough holes I go listen you have plenty of holes I'm going to get in behind you and, and we're going to do this so I get in behind him I end up kind of backing him up and we march through that apartment and put him out and they just you know listen you see the left you know, okay, you got a little bit more to the right. All right. And I remember telling him, listen, five more feet, man. I, and you make the right turn. I promise you it's going to get better. Promise you. And we made the five feet turn. And that was the bulk of the fire. And we got it from there. And he calmed right down. I think it's key for a company officer at any level, volunteer, paid, whatever, big, small, medium, it doesn't matter, to, to understand your fire, to really know them and, and know what's going on in their lives. Because... I had another fire where a guy was starting to come unglued. I could tell just by his breathing and his actions in the fire. He just, it was nothing deliberate anymore. He was just wildly whipping a nozzle around, just wildly. And I could tell, and I know the guy, and I, I've worked with him for a few years. So I knew that, you know, either he was you know, starting to become uncomfortable, maybe getting burned or, or something, but something was going on and his demeanor changed, you know, because I know my people. So I said to him, I'll, I'll never forget it. I, 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 I won't say his name. I'll make up a name. You know, like, hey, Ralph. I said, hey, Ralph, uh, what was the score of the Mets game? Now, we're in the, we're in the fire department. And I said, hey, Ralph, what was the score of the Mets game? And all of a sudden, he, he kind of looks at me and goes, what? I go, you know what? Let's put the fire out, and we'll get the score later on. And that was enough to slap him back to reality and calm him down. So as an officer, if you think you're a nozzle firefighter or even the backup firefighter starting to, because of their actions, because of their breathing, because of what they're saying, you, it, you may need to just say, hey, listen, pal, I'll be all right. Got two more rooms. We got this. Just, and, and, you know, as much as you want to scream, you, you can't, you know what I mean? You just can't. So um, pushing that line in there, like I said, I can talk a two-year-old through. Um, the one thing that I would say that we don't do it um, realistically enough is um, when we drill, you know, we have to drill operating the nozzle like we would at a fire, you know, and we need to do it in areas other than parking lots. You know, I don't go to a lot of parking lot fires and I see all these guys out teaching, pushing the line to a parking lot and that's all well and good. But the minute that line goes over the threshold of the front door, all that's out the window minute that line turns around a door frame, all that is out the window. It just doesn't work. So we've got to find areas that we can push that line in, make multiple turns, um, differences in elevation, and, and uh, training to, to operate the nozzle, you know, you know, at, at the ceiling and sweeping the floor. Like, like I asked guys, when's it, you know, when have you swept the floor? Because I never did. The only time I did was when I was burning. And if we build that 
into the way we train, it becomes, like we said earlier, that muscle memory action, that that mouse was just going to drop off the ceiling, back and forth on the floor, right back up to the ceiling, and that line's going to move on. So I don't need to remind them to do that because it's built into my training. Just like setting the door, people people walk up to a door uh, when they're forcing the door. First thing they do now, they, they're smashing with the back of the halogen, sounding the door, right? They don't even think about it. They walk up and do it. Now, I'm, I don't know if I'm a big fan of it, but, you know, a lot of people have built that into their forcible entry stuff. So they don't even think about it. They walk up, they bang the door. You know, that's the way it should be. I open the nozzle, I sweep the floor. It just should be built in what we do. You know, but pushing the line through the apartment and, and opening and closing the nozzle is my call. Right? That's my call. You, you don't open that nozzle until I tell you, and you keep it open until I tell you to shut it off. You know, I've had, I had a guy turn off the nozzle, and he goes, I got it, Lou, and I just looked at him, and I'm like, uh-uh, just like that. And we had two, three more rooms down the hallway. So, you know, as the officer, you're in total control of opening and closing that nozzle, except for the event of an emergency. If we're not flowing water and the place lights up, I shouldn't have to tell you to open the lock. You know what I mean? But other than that, you open it, and you leave it open until I, till I tell you to shut it off. Now, what was your, your, when were you opening up that nozzle? Because there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of debate about this. And, you know, wh when were you opening up that nozzle, whether it was to make that just a quick hit or when you were going to actually push in on the fire and, and flow and move to the, to the seat of the fire? Um, for me, like, I think that's a, it, it's, it's a, there's a big evaluation process there. I think mm -hmm. that, um, um, you know, everybody, you know, fires are different, fires are different, they say, well, whatever. But, you know, and they're producing more of this. And the, but if I can get in without flowing water right away, and everybody says, oh, you know, you're taking a chance. My nozzle firefighter is like a boxer when he has that line. You know, that line isn't dragging on a floor behind you. It isn't under his arm. That line is in the position to operate with his hand on the trigger. So if something happens, he can open it in a split second. You know what I mean? He's in a position to defend himself you know, and to defend the rest of the, the, the nozzle crew that's in there. So if I can get in and get to the seat of the fire without flowing water, 100% I'm going to do that. 100% I'm going to do that. Well, the fire where the guy wanted out, we had fire out in the public hallway. You know, we had to drive the fire back into the apartment. And that's not going to be a open it, drive it back in and shut it down and move in. Again, once I open it, that's it. It's time to fight. You know, and, and like I always tell guys, you shut that behind down? And they're like, yes. I go, you ever been in a bar fight? They say, yeah, I go, would you punch a guy in the face once and then put your hands to your side and let him punch you back? Would you do that? And he looks at me and I go, no, you'd punch him back and you'd keep punching him till he's on the floor. And then when he's on the floor, what are you going to do? You're going to put the boots to him. So why are we teaching guys, once we decide to operate that line, to shut it down, right? No, we shut it down to the guys on the floor and we're putting the boots to him. And then I tell my now, all right, shut it down. Let's see what we got. You know, see if he's got any fight left in him. But to knock it down and make that dash, that's that's ridiculous. It's you know, when it's time to fight, time to fight. Why give it a chance to punch you back? It doesn't make any sense to me. Never did. Never Absolutely. ever did. Absolutely. And so I think that the only time that that really ha has any merit would be when you're not in that, you're, you're not on that final approach. You're not in that hallway yet and things are getting a little a, a little snotty. So in your, so let, let's use for that way the, the audience can really picture this is we're just using a, a single, single family, single story ranch, for example, say mm -hmm. fires down the hallway in the bedroom, door gets opened up, we get a, a dump of nasty, you know, snotty smoke coming out of the front door. You know, we go push through into the living room. And as we're making our way through, if things get start to get really bad in that living room, would you check it at all at that point uh, to get just if it's getting crappy in that living room before you hit that that hallway well, to make your final approach? Well, we all know what happens when we flow water, hmm. right? We, we know what happens to the environment. I mean, even if it's getting shitty, I can still pretty much, you know, see a little bit, right? And I haven't driven, it might be warm, but I haven't driven any heat down on me yet. So if I had to hit it, 100%, I would. But and we're gonna we're gonna flow and go put the fire out, uh, you know. Like so, if I have a room at the end of a hallway, and the room's on fire and it's venting out into the hallway and it's running down the ceiling in the hallway, if I flow water down that hallway and, and knock it down, drive it back, as soon as I shut down the nozzle, what's gonna happen? It's coming right back. It's coming back. 
is coming back. So if I get to the point where I've got, a, you know, say a 20 foot hallway and I've got fire blown out of room and making that turn and coming at me in the hallway and I tell them, hey, open that line, we're leaving it open. I'm not going to give it a chance to punch me. Just not going to do it. You know, I especially like, so I can see where it's coming. From, right. So I'm at that 20 foot hallway and it's pretty shitty, but I can see the last room on the left hand side of the hallway is where the fire is. And I need to knock this down over my head. I don't, my door, I, I've got it. I know it's two doors down. I can flow the whole way and drive it down. And they, want, they talk about, you know, water damage and this and that. And I, I'm just like, you know, who's ever been to a house fire where it burned out one room and you thought, great save, great save, and go back the next day and the bulldozers are there, right? Knocking the house down. So, you know, we have to be realistic when it comes to our water application. You know, if I have a bedroom fire, I'm not flowing in the front door. That's That's reckless. It's just... You know, but if I get to a hallway and I've got a hallway that I've got fire in it, I'm going to flow down the hallway and make the turn. Simple as that. Knock the room down. Yeah, Simple as I, that. I think that the, just to break it down into to, to some, to some most simplistic terms, I think you just really nailed it was, you know, we're, if we're going to capitalize on any visibility that we have up to the point where we're on the approach. And then once we're on the approach, it, the line's staying open until the fire's out. I mean, that's about as simple as it gets. Yeah, and again, you know, at that point, what are we talking about as far as time to get down to 20 feet versus gallons per minute? And, you know, like, let's be realistic again <laughs> because, you know, the first 30 gallons are getting vaporized anyway, right? So, you know, the water damage from that. So it's it's not a it's not a huge amount of water that we're, we're flowing to get down the hallway and make that. It's not like we're gonna sit there and put 500 gallons just to cool the hallway off to make that turn. You know, and again, it's, and, and I get that balance of of, um, of of being safe and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we still have to put that fire out realistically. You know what I mean? And I think it, it you know, once you, once you invert that environment with, with flowing, with, with that premature flowing of water, you know, you make that environment and everybody says, oh, it's, you're, you're cooling it down. But you're making it unsafe though. You know, I, I, my visibility becomes zero. I don't care what anybody, it's done. You know, and it's a, a while before I get anything back. And the thing is, is if I've moved, how do I know where I've gone? I, I like limited visibility for as long as I can. You know, especially to identify where the fire is. So, and that's just me. Yeah. yeah. No, and I think that, that's perfect. I mean, and it, it really looks, it's not, it's, it's not even, you know, gallons per minute, if you look at it, but you know, by the second, so you say, you, mean, you take that, that longest stretch of a, of a 20 foot hallway, we're going to the end, even just be modest and say, we're taking, you know, we're going one, one foot a second, you know, one, one step being one foot a second, that's 20 seconds of that line being open. Yeah, so you make that final long. turn. That's, that's it, not that much water. It takes you a minute to get down the hallway, which is a long time. 180 gallons, right? And it, so, and it's not, it's not going to take you a minute to get down the hallway. No. You know, once, because if it does, I'm getting someone else on the nozzle. You know, once we <laughs> say go, once we flow, let's go. You know, and moving, moving a flowing inch and three quarter is not a hard thing to do. You know, I'm not an advocate of gating it down. The two and a half is a different animal. You know, and I've always said when it comes to those two lines, the fire service has not caught up with it at all. You know, because we're so everyone wants to work in a truck, everyone wants a howling in their hand or a saw in their hand, you know, and you know, a two and a half nozzle and an inch and three quarter nozzle is not the same tool. A two and a half line and it, it's not, it's two different engine tools used two different ways. And we still train teaching guys to use the line the same way. It's ridiculous. You know, moving the two and a half, you know, there are certain ways that I think work. You know, there's a lot of other people out there with a lot of other, you know ways of doing it um and like i said i haven't been to a lot of parking lot fires so yeah and i think that's the, that's the key there too is just you talked about you know layering in the layering in the variables so it's adding in the contents adding in the turns adding in the the elevation changes so that's but, where, where people looking for all that way if you don't train that way when you do encounter it you're not going to have a solution for it. Even I've, I've watched lines not be able to be pushed in because of a screen door. Hmm. Because of a screen door. 
you know, so if we're not drilling on those stretching across the parking lot, hey, listen, have at it. You want to put a nozzle and show, show what back pressure is, have at it. But challenge them. Your drill should be more challenging than the fire. You know, guys are like, oh, we don't want to give a drill if the guy fails. And I'm like, well, why? What's the risk of failing or, or not doing the job right at a drill? You learn something. What's the risk of failing on a fire drill? You know, so that's what I, you know, when, when I'm teaching out at Jimmy McCormick's place, the fire department training network, you know, we challenge these guys. And and that's one thing that everybody leaves there, they say it's probably the most challenging stuff they have. And, and most guys get through it. But, you know, like, if I'm not challenging, you think the fire is not going to challenge you someday? It's going to, it's just, so we need to drill for those variables when we're stretching hose and advancing line. And if we don't, if the first time you encounter it is at a fire, guess what? That's called failure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's great. And, it, you know, not to discourage anyone, like you said, the, if, if you're limited on resources in the parking lots, all, all you have, it's, it's fine for no, you know, no, te teaching somebody I, new. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure nobody's. No, no. It, like, listen, drill, drill, drill. But, you know, and, and you know, so I've pushed lines across parking lots, that, you know, show them. But, you know, you can... You can go behind the firehouse and use the exterior wall of the firehouse for a turn. You don't need to build anything with pallets if you don't have it to do it. You can go outside the firehouse and make a turn around the back wall of the firehouse just to make that hard turn and have a pinch point for that line. Take a, take a couple of two by fours and have the line go up over a two by four in a straight line. You know, but, you know, Every drill is good. I'm not going to say that, you know, parking lot drills aren't good. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, um, there's a lot of it out there. And to me, you know, we're not challenging because it's looked at as a pre-designated, like, oh, you know what, like I said, all right, they all go out, so what? Yeah, but, you know, we're talking about efficiency and we're talking about we're prepared for the one that matters. You know, if they can build, it doesn't matter. It's training for me. But when I have four kids trapped at the back of the apartment, then it matters. And if I if I can't stretch hose because I can't get over the, the door frame or make one turn and I don't have a solution for that because I haven't drilled on that, then that's a big deal. And that's all I'm saying. Just, you know, when you're drilling, be challenging to your firefighters. Yeah. And I think that's a good good message to, to leave people with is you know, just make making sure that we're we're doing our jobs and that we're we're prepared for the fight because you know, if we don't up the ante in, in, in training, the fire is going to do it for us. And that, that's not the time to, to be experimenting or, or testing our metal for the first Fires time anyways. Fires have a sense of humor. Just when you think you know everything, <laughs> fire has a funny way making sure you don't. Yeah, you're not kidding. No, I so, did this for a long time. And I and like I tell everybody, I there's so much I don't know. And uh, I never claim to know everything. And the, the day I thought that I, if I did, was the day I needed to retire. Because if you think you know everything, you're dangerous. That's what you are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Well, and I think you just kind of touched on it, but I'll, I'll leave the door open in case you, you want to say anything different. But so the, the whole point of this is to just recreate these, you know, casual firehouse kitchen table like conversations, you know, those informal drill, drills that are had where we're just talking shop about the job. But if you were having this conversation with a new firefighter, what would the of everything we talked about, or what would be the, the one thing or the one lesson or that you would want that new firefighter to, to walk away with and, and keep in the, the forefront of their mind when they went to their next fire? Well, I mean, train, 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 right? And and never accept mediocrity. Never accept. You can always, always be better. And, and listen, every every day, every run. Every time you is a training, you know, lesson. You, you take something away from everything. You know, every fire, if it's one thing, if you leave, if you go to work, you go to the firehouse and you come home with one thing you didn't go there with, that's that's the benefit. You know, just never feel like, okay, I, I'm I'm to the point that I, I you know, I, I I know how to do that. And I, I always tell officers, if, if you've got a, a fireman that doesn't want to do something, you know, when he says, oh, I know how to do that, I'm good. You know what he's telling you? He's telling you he doesn't know how to do that. So, and I tell guys, you know how you get a guy to do that without even telling him? Do it yourself first. You're the officer, 
you know, if it's bailing out a window or tying a knot or doing something, do it first. Then he's got no excuses. And then if he looks bad, he made himself look bad. And you're not forcing him to do something to make himself look bad. You just do it yourself. And then they're, they're home. I'll tell you nine times out, they're going to have to do it. You know, but just, just keep learning as much as you can and pick a subject. And, you know, like I'm an engine guy. That's, that's, you know, I, could I worked in a truck? Sure. I could. I mean, most of those guys are stupid. But, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I enjoyed engine work and I made it my passion to learn as much as I could. I mean, I don't know it all. There's guys out there that know way more than me, but um, just learn every day because you just never know. You know, you don't know what you know until you use it. Until something pops up, like, where the hell did I learn that? And it might be just that kitchen table conversation you had, you know, a month ago with some guy BSing about a building on Main Street or Franklin Avenue or somewhere. Uh, but you don't know what you know until you use it. So just keep learning every day. Love it. Well, Tim, I can't thank you enough. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to 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 get to sit down and talk shop with you, and because I always walk away with with you know so so much more and. You know, I appreciate it. So. Stab me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> so again, th thank you for taking the time out and sitting yeah. down and, and sharing yeah. all this with with everybody else, so we could, we could all get better. I mean, that's the big thing here is just you know getting getting better each and every day, so we can be that much more effective at our next fire. Yeah, that's about. Yep, one hundred percent. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Tell thanks you, Dad. I said I will do. Uh, thanks again, Tim, and all thank right. you everyone listening in and. Hope you can take these lessons and apply them to your next fire. Take care.